Hello, everybody. Thank you for attending. Nice to be here again. Uh, today, I will be talking about a. Well, I initially planned on talking about more than just one video game, but due to limitations of, you know, due to you know lack of time and. Uh, to be honest, dearth in number of video games dealing with, dealing with, with Shakespeare, I will basically focus on one and mention, mention some of the ones I talk about in the abstract uh, during this uh, presentation. So, um, yeah, let's commence. Um, as a canonic figure, Shakespeare has been present in all important media in various adapted forms, from music and opera to cinema and comic books. Shakespeare's plays have not only expanded to roughly all media associated with high culture, but also to those usually regarded as low culture. Moreover, in the aftermath of deconstruction and post-structuralism, the adaptations of Shakespeare's plays have been less concerned with the representation of an allegedly ape-historical true Shakespeare, but instead have been keen on repurposing Shakespeare to suit local and sometimes marginal cultural context. In spite of the hospitality encountered by the, by the bards plays in virtually all media, there is one highly popular medium that has so far been reluctant to adapt Shakespeare, namely video games. While there are indeed indie games and games on a small scale that uh, adapt Shakespeare, and if you look them up on, on, on Steam, you will find some, uh, and there's also a very promising point-and-click adaptation of Hamlet called Elsinore, which we have been waiting for for some years now and hopefully it will, you know, be released at some point. Um, so despite of these uh, examples, Shakespeare has been less successful in penetrating the AAA games in industry, especially action games. Uh, this phenomenon was easily explainable in the 90s when action video games, also due to their limited technological affordances of the video cards, would usually rely on the formulaic plots of blockbuster action films that foregrounded the action spectacle to the disadvantage of character depth and development. Around the year 2000, the AAA video game industry saw a narrative turn, a narrative turn with uh, game designers using ever more complex cinematics and dialogues to heighten the narrativity of video games. What is indeed surprising is that even in, the, even in this context of video games' ambition to achieve a high art status, Shakespeare is yet to make um, the story of a AAA video game. Notwithstanding this, uh, there are a few AAA video games that do share an intertextual link to Shakespeare, one of them being Rockstar's Manhunt 2, and uh, there are other examples, for instance, uh, you will find some Shakespeare in Metal Gear Solid, Solid 4, you will find some Shakespeare in Bioshock Infinite, I guess. Um, but uh, it is a Manhunt 2 which can actually be regarded as an adaptation of Shakespeare, as I shall try to prove in the next minutes. Now, uh, Manhunt 2 is a stealth survival horror video game that tells the story of Daniel Lamb, a mentally deranged former scientist suffering from amnesia and disassociative identity disorder, who, along with his alter ego, Leo Casper, is on a quest to remember his past and take his revenge on his former superior, Dr. Pickman. As the game progresses, Lamb learns that he had been part of a project that sought to create a perfect assassin. This assassin could activate his killer alter ego during the mission and deactivate it afterwards so that he could never remember his mission upon completion. Uh, at one point in the game, Daniel Lamb and his alter ego, uh, Leo Casper, get close to Dr. Pickman, the villain, but he suddenly fades when hearing the lines, I quote, What seest thou in the dark, backward, and abysm of time? From Shakespeare's The Tempest. This quotation establishes an overt intertextual link to the play and opens a new avenue of interpretation of the game's plot. I argue that, rather than being a mere quotation of no significant consequence for the plot, the mission origins adapts, or to be more precise, appropriates the play's second scene of the first act in order to comment on the authority enjoyed by the alchemist slash magician in the Renaissance and uh, his updated status, the scientist in modern times. Now, I'd just briefly like to play uh, 
a few minutes of uh, the, the mission called Origins from, from the Guinness walkthrough. Uh, I hope we have sound. Okay. Ah, I should mention this. Uh, this video game uh, has an extremely explicit violent content. Uh, it has been banned virt virtually all around the world. I mean, I mean, just the game for that Shakespeare happens to be very, you know, controversial in terms of content. So uh, I do apologize for gory and, you know, uh, well, not very conventional uh, scenes in terms of visual content. I hope there won't be very many. I know. relevant to, to notice here is that from that point onward, onward in order to beat the level what you have to do is shoot the speakers from where the quotation from Shakespeare is being recited. So, uh, so before going into the, the analysis proper I'll just have a brief uh, description of the method and the concept that I will be using. So um, what does it mean to comment on and appropriate a source text? As with any case of inter intertextuality, the extent to which the adaptation stays true to the source text varies. Adaptation studies have so far offered a variety of classifications to cover the wide range of adaptation practices. This wide range of adap adaptation practices. Um, in the present uh, paper, I will be using two concepts, namely that of commentary and appropriation. A commentary is, a, is an adaptation that, by, by making additions to the source text, challenges its, uh, its politics. An appropriation, on the other hand, is an adaptation that has uh, the source undergo a process of approximation, which means that the narrative content of the original text is updated to a new cultural context, usually a contemporary one, and sometimes altered to suit a new genre. Commentary and appropriation are not mutually exclusive categories. Quite on the contrary, an adaptation can, be sim can, be simulta can simultaneously be both a commentary and an appropriation of the source, as it is the, as it is the case with Manhunt 2. Now, uh, in The Tempest, scene 2, act 1, Prospero... Uh, are you familiar with Shakespeare's The Tempest? Okay, so, uh, Prospero finds Miranda secluded on an island talking about their past together. After having spent many years together on the island, Prospero decides it is time to, it, it is time to recount Miranda, the events that had brought them to the island in the first place. Uh, Miranda seems to be suffering from a form of amnesia purposefully, purposefully caused by Prospero's magic. After checking to see if Miranda was still oblivious to her past, Prospero says, I quote, "'Tis, tis time I should inform thee farther, lend thy hand and pluck my magic garment from me." The quotation suggests that the reason why, Mi why Miranda couldn't remember her, her past was Prospero's magic garment, which, once taken away, would bring back Miranda's full cognitive capacities. What is more, although unaware of her past, Miranda makes no attempt to bring back her memories, 
as shown in her reply. I quote, I have, I have done nothing but in care of thee, O thee, so this is Prospero saying, I have done nothing but in care of thee, O thee, my dear one, thee, my daughter, who art ignorant of what thou art, no, not knowing of whence I am, nor that I am more better than Prospero, master of a full, of a full poor cell, and thy no greater father. Miranda replies, more to know did never meddle with my thought, because of course women had to be submissive in, uh, in the Renaissance. So Miranda says, I did not want to know anything else, anything but what you have told me so far. Taking all this into account, Miranda's relationship to Prospero seems to be one of accepted, of accepted submission, with Prospero imposing his authority through the use of magic. As the play progresses, we learn that Prospero is a, is a quite authoritative figure in the sense that he also subdues other uh, entities such as Ariel and Caliban. In the mission Origins, Manhunter borrow, borrows the Prospero Miranda couple and updates it to the context of the video game's modern fictional universe and the generic conven conventions of the action genre. The play's pre modern mag magician is now a modern scientist who exerts his authority over those around him with the help of science. Miranda's position is taken up by a male character, Daniel Lamb, who forgets his past as a result of Dr. Pickman's experiments. Yet, unlike Shakespeare's play, where Miranda was passive to Prostero's actions, Daniel Lamb challenges Dr. Pickman's authority and undertakes a complicated quest to remember his past. This way, Daniel's revolt against Dr. Pickman comments on the, polit on the politics of the source text. In The Tempest, Prospero's authority over Miranda is twofolded. Firstly, he is a magician, therefore belongs to what we today might call the intelligentsia, because when revealing to Miranda his past preoccupations, Prospero presents himself as a scholar. I quote, and Prospero, the prime duke, being so reputed in dignity for the, and for the liberal arts, without a parallel, those being all my study, I thus neglecting worldly ends, all dedicated to closeness and the bettering of my mind. And secondly, he is Miranda's father. The video game's appropriation of the Prospero Miranda character couple leaves aside the gender politics implied by Prospero's being her father and focuses solely on Prospero's, now Pikmin's, elitist status, which the game tries to challenge. Daniel Lamb's fight to learn the truth about his past serves two goals in the adaptation work. Besides the commentary on the authority of the intelligentsia, it also contributes to the narrative design of the video game. As explained earlier, video action video games have always been keen on mainstream action film stock plot recipes. One such stock plot recipe is centered on an artificially created super soldier that goes rogue and seeks to take his revenge on those who created him. Manhunt 2 faithfully follows this type of plot by having Daniel Lamb, the perfect assassin, go against his creator, Dr. Pickman. Yet, unlike earlier video games, by adapting Shakespeare's The Tempest, Manhunt 2 entertains an, in an interesting intertextual dialogue with the source that not only adds depth to the story framing the game mechanics, but also lends, sim lends symbolic capital to the video game, raising it to a higher cultural status. In spite of the social cultural benefits of, of adapting Shakespeare, the game is by no means reverential towards the source, towards the source text. Quite on the contrary, the game's rebuttal of authority on the intra-textual level, Lamb refutes Pickman's authority, tunes in with Manhunter's rejection of the canon. As already explained, Daniel Lamb is, a, is a psychologically conditioned to faint when hearing Prospero's words. I quote, <coughs> what sits down in the dark back, backward in the abysm of time. When Lamb reaches the facility where Dr. Pigman conducts his experiments, the doctor approaches Lamb on the speakers and says the quotation causing Lamb to lose consciousness. After regaining his consciousness, Lamb must shoot down every set of speakers he encounters in the facility before Pigman can repeat the quotation. The act of literally destroying Shakespeare's text works on two, level, on two levels. It represents Lamb's struggle to escape Dr. Pickman's authority, but at the same time works on an intertextual level by signaling the game's rejection of its own hypotext and the canon. Yet, yet by acknowledging its indebtedness to the canon and at the same time rejecting it, Manhunt 2 adopts a postmodern stance in the sense that while trying to break from the canon, the game admits that the purists break from 
the past cannot be achieved and instead is engaged in a critical revisiting of its uh, literary genealogy. Along these lines, the video games quotation of Shakespeare sheds new light upon its status as an adaptation. It is rather uncommon for, for an appropriation to overtly reference its source text, either by indicating its title or, or by quoting from it. By, directing, by directly quoting Prospero from Shakespeare's play, my Manhunt 2 is nevertheless no less of an appropriation than many of its counterparts in various media, but rather it acknowledges the genealogy of the text hidden beneath each narrative. The video game's postmodern character lies not only in its ambivalent relationship with the canon, but also in its self-reflexive metatextual comment on the issue of authority and control associated with its own mediality. Video games are not fully linear narrative media like books or films. Their storytelling affordances revolve around their interactivity, which takes away some of the authorial authority, uh, sorry, yeah, and uh, distributes it to the players. While the narrative agency of players varies from genre to genre or, from, or, or even from game to game, usually in the case of action video games, the player has to follow a more or less linear path that takes the player from one plot bottleneck to the other, thus guaranteeing the progression of the plot. Some video games self-reflexively comment on their own interactivity and highlight the illusion of agency and control enjoyed by the players. In games such as Fear, Bioshock, or Spec Ops The Line, the playable character is at first presented as the protagonist of the game so that the ludic motivation behind play may be supported by an ethical narrative one. After the player has defeated the antagonist of the game, uh, the playable character is revealed to have been actually the antagonist all along. Consequently, the player is frustrated for having committed her deeds, but at the same time, the lack of an, alter uh, the lack of an alternative narrative path is stressed. Moreover, the alleged narrative agency enjoyed by gamers is questioned and the authority of the game designers is reinforced. Games such as Free and Bioshock are even more persistent in commenting on the player's lack of choice, albeit the interactivity of the game, by giving the player a series of clues throughout the game that make some players realize from very early stages that uh, what they are doing in the fictional world of the game is morally wrong. As a result, in such games, not only is the comment on the mediality of the video games harsher, but the hypermediacy of this narrative is also heightened. In Manhunt 2, the player gets to play either Daniel Lamb or Leo Kasp uh, Kaspersky in different missions. Although the cutscenes present them together, they never work together during gameplay, and Leo Kaspersky can be heard giving advice to Daniel only in the missions where the latter is the playable character. Towards the end of the game, in the mission entitled Domestic Disturbance, Leo Kaspersky has to make his way through a series of police to a house in a suburbia. Once he enters the house, the game cuts and we see a cutscene with Daniel Lamb, smirched in blood, holding a knife while his wife is lying dead on the floor. As it turns out, Leo Kaspersky had been Daniel Lamb's killer alter ego, which implies that Daniel Lamb was effectively the killer of his own family. The late twist in the, plot, in the plot compels the player to radically reinterpret the role of Daniel Lamb, Leo, the roles of Daniel Lamb, Leo Kaspersky, and Dr. Pickman, Pickman in the video game. Uh, Dr. Pickman, the character blocking Lamb from his past and the one to blame for his mental state, can at least be excused for trying to keep Daniel Lamb from causing more harm and keep the situation under control. Daniel Lamb, on the other hand, is no longer seen as the hero, and his deeds lose their ethical justification, which has set the tone for the player's narrative engagement at the beginning of the game. At this point, the player is likely to regret having been actively engaged in killing Daniel Lamb's family, yet is also aware that, had the player anticipated the, from the very onset how the plot would unravel, he or she would still have been incapable of altering the chain of events. In fact, the more attentive player would have noticed that in the game's first mission, Awakening, Daniel Lamb stumbles upon a dead body that looks just like Leo Kaspersky. As a result, it would have been possible to infer that, since the text actual world of the game featured a dead person who looked like, who looked like Leo, coupled with the fact that Leo Kaspersky is never seen alongside Daniel Lamb during the, missions, uh, during the mission game, gameplay, that Daniel Lamb's psychic was a figment of his, of, um, 
his imagination. Now, should the player notice this minute detail and make all the necessary inferences as the game progresses, the incapacity to influence the narrative would only be augmented. Taking all this into account, it is safe to say that Mannheim II raises the theme of authority and control from a textual level to a metatextual level and self-reflexively comments on the alleged narr uh, narrative agency of the player. In this paper, I have analyzed Man Manhunt 2 with, spe with special focus on its 11th mission origins as an adaptation of the second scene of Act 2 from Shakespeare's The Tempest. Rather than being a faithful adaptation, the video game recontextualizes the scene by transposing the original narrative elements into a fictional contemporary world. Not only does the video game update the content of the scene, but it also comments on the politics of the source text by, ch by challenging the authority of Dr. Pickman, i.e. the updated Prospero. Authority and its reject rejection are treated on four levels. The mutations undergone by the source, by the source text signal a disavowal of the authority enjoyed by Prospero in the game's hypotext, while intertextually the distortion of the, outspoke, of the outspoken text of the play suggests the rejection of the authority of the canon. Nevertheless, unlike the modernists of the 20th century, Manhunt 2 does not thoroughly deny the canon, but rather, in a postmodern fashion, repurposes Shakespeare's text in order to subvert it. On an intratextual level, the game brings to the foreground Daniel Lamb's revolt against Dr. Pickman, while lastly, the video game metatextually comments on the narrative affordances of video games and the way these affordances empower the game designer as, and at the same time give the player the illusion of control. Therefore, given its ambivalent relationship with the canon and its self-reflexive self -reflexive comment on its own mediality, it's safe to claim that Manhunt 2 embodies a postmodern aesthetics. Thank you.